It's been a busy weekend for us. Uh, we were in Copesville on Friday night, and I want you to know that for those of you that are unable to make it, we continue to appreciate your prayers as we go out, uh, because although we're not all able to be in the building together, I do believe that the prayers of the saints are certainly a blessing to us in doing and accomplishing the great works of ministry. And I'm telling you that deliverance was in the house on Friday night, and people received great breakthrough, et cetera. And I just thank God again for his faithfulness. I never take it for granted. You probably get tired of me saying it. And at some point you're probably like, aren't we used to this happening all the time? Well, y'all get used to it. I'm still thankful for it, and I don't take it for granted. So I really appreciate what God does uh, for us and for his people. John chapter 21. John chapter 21. And I want to begin at verse 15. John chapter 21, looking at verse 15. So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? And we'll give you the context for the these in a couple of moments. He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, Thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Let's pray, Father, in Jesus' name. This is your word. We give it back to you. We pray, God, that we'll accomplish what you want to accomplish this morning, this afternoon in our hearts, that it will continue to transform us, that it will illuminate our minds, that it will increase our capacity for ministry, increase our understanding, and that, God, today we will hear your heart, your concern, your passion, that your will will be done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated. I want to speak on this morning. It's a really simple thought. It simply says, feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Words of red say, feed my sheep. Feed my um, sheep. What, what's happened here is that in the preceding chapters, you'll recall that Jesus has been crucified. He has died. He has been buried. But I'm so glad that he also rose again. And in rising again, he showed us um, once and for all that not only did he have power over sickness, not only did he have power over demons, um, but he even had power over death. He even had power over what seemed to be mankind's greatest enemy, um, that being death. And so that not even the grave was able to hold him down. And we hear those great prophetic or um, poetic even words um, that come from the apostle where he says things like, Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? And we feel the triumph that emerges from coming up from the grave. I mean, I don't know if it were me and I were Jesus, I'm far from him, but if I were and I were dead, it's like, yeah, I'm up from that. It's just an amazing thought. See, y'all, y'all read too fast. Y'all get, y'all miss the excitement, right? People that are novel readers, you know, y'all get it, right? Because like, you, you know how you really get into the novel? You got to really get into the word like that and really see what it means um, for somebody to be dead and then to come back to life. This just doesn't happen every day. You know, we read the Bible, yeah, you got up, whatever. But really, he really did get up to understand what that means to disciples when it seemed like all their hope was lost, when it seemed like their future was in peril. For Jesus to actually come back and actually do what he said meant so much. Uh, I, I think that when someone is gone, when someone's taken away from you for a period of three days, and then they come back to you and they begin to show themselves to you, um, it does something weird to the relationship. I can't describe what it does because I haven't experienced it like that, but you have to imagine that it does. Um, and Jesus, when he comes back to his disciples, in this instance, what we're going to see is Jesus appearing to them while they are fishing, which indicates that something has happened in the lives of the disciples after Jesus has died. You see what happened. They went back to what was familiar. 
They went back to what was comfortable. Because many of us remember that when Jesus was calling some of them, they were in the midst of fishing, and Jesus said, come, follow me. And now, after having followed him, after him having been killed brutally, after him being the, the victim of capital punishment, uh, the disciples began, Peter and Peter just go back and say, you know what, this is what I know, this is what I'm good at doing. I'm going back to my own business. And so he goes back to his business, he begins fishing. Um, and, it, and it seems like, it, it almost seems like it, it feels right. It almost seems like it's the right thing to do. It almost seems like maybe this is, you know, I, I'm moving on. And I think to a certain extent that, that that's kind of what it is too. It's, yeah, that, that was a good run. Wow, that was good hope. Yeah, that was a wonderful idea. But I guess it's time for us to move on to the next phase now. I guess I want to get back on to getting things back to normal. But I want to let you know that once you encounter Jesus, you never really get back to normal, no matter how hard you try. Once you encounter Jesus, you never really get to really go back to who you used to be, what you used to do, what used to be you. Because not only has Jesus come into your life, but he's made an absolute change in you that even when you try to go back to what you were, you're not the same person that you were before. Anybody a witness of that? Try to go back to what used to be comfortable. Try to go back to the things that used to be like, yeah, I used to feel so different when I did this. And now it's not the same anymore because not only has God brought me out of the situation, but I'm not the same as the person that I used to be. It's more than words, it's more than poetic form, that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, the whole all things become new. Um, it's interesting, um, this is not the first time that Jesus has introduced himself to them. Um, Thomas in the previous scripture, or previous chapter, will be introduced to him and will say, unless I can like really touch him and fear him, I'm not going to believe this. And yet they really had not come to full grasp with what it means for Jesus to be risen from the dead. They had not really come to fully understand what's my place, what does he really want from me, what does this mean for us as disciples, because they had gotten so used to him walking with them and talking with them, and now that he is this new, risen, resurrected Jesus, what does resurrected Jesus do, and what does it, ha what does it mean for us? And still trying to formulate this I told you before, they've gone back to fishing, and now Jesus appears to them in their environment where they're fishing, and he says, bring me some food and all that kind of stuff, and they come, and, and they, they die, and they have this wonderful eating thing, and I know that for Lady Blackman in particular, she's very happy to know that resurrected bodies can eat. Right? Very happy to know that, that even when you die and rise again, you still can eat, because Jesus apparently um, is eating food here, and after they've got through this dining experience, and they got through this opportunity of fellowship, Jesus asked Peter a question that is probing. It's a question that by the third time is disturbing. He says, do you love me? Do you really love me more than even these? Do you love me more than this? This whole like, life that you've built around your occupation, this whole love, these great fish that we've caught, do you love me more than this? Do you really love me? And he says, if you do, then I need you to do something for me. And that is, because what, what's my job here? I need you to do something for me. And that is feed my lambs. And so he becomes very, very concerned about these lambs, about these sheep that even though he is risen from the dead, somebody's got to be responsible for the next generation. Somebody's got to be responsible for the next generation of disciples that will be coming up. And it's interesting to note that Jesus, if we're really honest with ourselves, he really did not leave the disciples until he had given to them by means of impartation everything they would need in order to be successful once he left here and gave them the gift of the Holy Spirit. And although you may look at Peter and say, 
got some issues and, um, and, and a number of them, and Thomas with his issues. At the end of the day, if you look at the fact and think about that it's 2015 and that these events happened in around 30 AD and that people are still telling the story that these 11 disciples plus one was telling, I think they did a pretty good job and God knew how to propel them forward. But the only reason why we are here to even know the story, stand here, open up a text, sing songs about it, is because at some point somebody decided that it was worth the investment to do something called feeding sheep. And although there are many glamorous occupations that people like to do, great things that people think mean so much, at the end of the day, if the church is not successful in feeding lambs and feeding sheep and giving what really needs to be given from a nourishment standpoint, we will not survive. And so it becomes incumbent upon each and every one of us to devote ourselves to the extent that we say that we love Jesus, we cannot love him if we do not occupy ourselves with this notion of there's somebody else who's dependent upon me to provide them a source of food, to provide them a source of inspiration, to provide them a source, even if it's just my testimony, somebody's life is dependent upon the provision I need to be able to give to them. He says to Simon Peter, feed my sheep, feed my lambs. Isn't it an interesting um, task to do? It's an interesting work to do. It, it sounds easy, but you know from the psalmist this whole notion of he leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He, 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 um, he actually causes me, he leads me um, beside the still waters, all those sort of things, right? Green pastures that I can eat from. And you begin to realize as you picture that psalm in your head that it's so much more um, than merely, you know, finding somebody and passing them a track. You know, if I'm really honest with you, I think that where the church really needs help is we need to really find out how to really grab somebody and really disciple them how to really get somebody that doesn't know the Lord and not just give them a few good inspirational, encouraging words, but actually help them to walk it out. Um, it's interesting. You don't just, it's funny. I think that sometimes we're so used to our domesticated animals like, you know, dogs and cats. You know, you get a dog or a cat. I know cats because I have cats, right? You get cat, you get the food. In fact, you can be lazy now. On TV, they get these crystal dishes. Right? And they open up the can and go, and they pour it into the dish and they like prop it down with a fork and all that kind of stuff. Then they sit it down and then the cat goes and eats his fancy feast or whatever it's called. And our house would look a little bit different. Um, we'd go open up that can and sit the can on the ground and then the cat would eat it. But it was a very interesting approach to feeding because after that, you know, you gave them the food and they go about their business. And because they're cats, they don't really care too much about you. And when they want you, they come, and when they don't, they don't. And they're pretty independent. Right. Now, sheep are a little bit different. You never saw a farmer go out there with like a can of sheep food <laughs> and say, here, eat this, and the sheep goes and eats it. You have to prepare an environment where the sheep, first of all, even feels comfortable and safe enough to eat. And then you've got, because it feeds off of the ground, it's not just enough to, to, to provide him grass, but you've got to make sure the environment in which he is being grazed is conducive to producing grass so that when he's calm enough and stable enough, he can actually sit there and begin to graze upon the grass. You've got to take care of the life. So, so much more goes into it. And on top of that, although, you know, you know, we tend to get animals that are like, you know, what do you call those things? Carnivorous, right? The ones that like eat other animals. We get, you know, because even though it's like dogs and cats, you might say, cats are, you know, they're carnivorous, you know, they, they, they can hold their own. Dogs, we hope, can hold their own, right? You know, they, they go out there and they, they, they got teeth and they can bite and all that kind of stuff. But when you're dealing with sheep, they don't got the right teeth to attack nobody. And so there they are, they're, they're constantly the target. And things that would not normally attack you or attract themselves to you, um, they, 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 they gravitate towards your environment because you've got the sheep here. And sheep are not predators, but sheep are prey. And so 
so there's not only the concern of ensuring that you are now feeding these sheep and providing something where they can eat, etc., and they make sure you get them water, making sure that they, they don't get all kinds of mites and all that kind of stuff about, but you also got to now protect them from wolves that would actually come in the midst of the sheep that would try to devour them while you're trying to feed them. And at the end of the day, the sheep thank you, I guess, by giving you nice clothes of wool and all that sort of stuff. But if you don't really love Jesus in the process, sometimes it can seem like a whole lot of work for a relatively little bit of return. And what Jesus is saying is that, no, you've got, if you love me, you've got to feed this next generation of sheep that are coming up. And look at how Jesus fed his sheep. And you've got to go back and look at the text. Because you know, we read it, and he did this with they did that miracle, etc. But look at how he walked with them and demonstrated patience and kindness and long-suffering and showed them what it was to be an example, etc. Don't you know that's the same thing that you've got to do? We don't, you don't get to feed sheep from a distance. You don't get to, you know, feed sheep, go all over here. All right, sheep, you go eat, whatever. But if you notice, you even go around here, you'll see that the sheep are usually kept in relatively close quarters. They usually have, like, protective fences around them so that nobody will come and bother them. So they don't go wandering off somewhere and all that kind of stuff. And so there is this thing that is incumbent upon we that will be his disciples to say, you know what, I've got responsibility um, to feed and to nourish and to take care of somebody else. That all of this information that God has given to me, he actually wants me to find someone else to deposit this into. Now, this is John's um, relation of the story, but notice it does parallel in a large way um, the, the great commission that Jesus will give in Matthew. So while here you're reading things about feeding my sheep, and Matthew will hear things like, go into all the world and teach all nations, baptizing them, right? Just observe some things I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you, even to the end of the world. There is a great responsibility for us, and we cannot complain about the malnourished state of the next generation if we're not doing our part, which is feeding them. If we're not doing our part, which is feeding them. What are we giving? What are we dispensing? What are we providing um, to people that really are in need of this great salvation that we have experienced? And after they have come to the point of belief, how are we helping them to grow and to nourish and to develop? I think that part of the struggle, part of the issue is that we don't have enough people with feet on the ground to really show people how to walk this thing out. I, I, I know I tell this all the time. It's not enough, and, and we have created a weird academic church culture. We have created this mindset that, you know, you come to church, you say that you believe in the Lord or whatever, we baptize you, hopefully you get the Holy Spirit or what have you, and then we hand you a Bible and say, this is all you need to live, but we don't have people really partnered up with one another to actually say, you know what, this is really how you walk this thing out. This is really how you deal with this thing. Really, it only comes when you when you go through the experience of living life with other people. What I'm telling you is that you can't be disconnected from the sense of your interaction with people and be effective in discipling them. They need you to be there at those moments when their faith really is about to come crashing down and they need to hear, what do, what do you do when it feels like you just don't believe anymore? Anybody ever been there before? It's like, I don't understand. I don't know what this is happening to me. And that's when we need people that will be able to feed them the word of God that they might be able to say, you know what, you can make it and help them to get eventually to even self-provision, right? So what we really need to, to help people to do. How do we get people to get stronger, to get strengthened, to get nourished in him? How do you dispense the right word at the right time? Part of it is reading the words that you can grow, but there comes a point where it's like part of it is I'm reading the word, etc., because I need to grow and then I can share with somebody else what are the things that have worked for me. And part of it is actually asking yourself the tough questions, asking yourself the difficult questions, and asking yourself, how did I survive that? What did I do? Because nobody, I say something, nobody wants to hear your academic Christianity. People want to hear how this thing really plays out. How does this thing really work? Okay, let's try it this way. What did you really do when you had paid your tithes 
and there was a whole lot of bills, and it looked like I, it's not working. How does how does that really how does that really really play out? You know, not the theory, not the not the preached message, but how does it really play out in everyday life? And what do you tell yourself? when you don't understand why it's not always working out the way they expected it to. We all testify in church about the job that we got after we prayed, but what happens when you went to the interview and you didn't get the job that you really wanted to get and now you're frustrated? That's where discipleship comes in because that's where sometimes we lose people and nobody's there beside them telling them, yeah, I've been there, I've done that, and although I didn't get this job, God had something better, but you have to be able to hold on and wait in the midst of the process, right? That's where the discipleship really comes in. When it's hard to believe, when God is challenging you to believe something that's absolutely like just crazy, and you, and, and, and you know what it is when you're a believer, and you tell your friends and your family about it, they're like, oh, you, you, you done lost your mind, right? And no one can relate to it, and no one seems to believe with you, and you need somebody that can say, you know what, I know it sounds crazy, but I, I, I do believe. And then you believe together, and then you see God do it. That's how we help people to go through the discipleship process. That's how we help them to grow in their faith and get strengthened in God. But we've got to make the investment of feeding these sheep. We've got to make the investment of seeing what God does. Now, here's where it gets really annoying. Because I make it sound like there's a sheep wandering around waiting for you to come get to me. Like, hey, all right, here we go, sign me up. The issue is that oftentimes you have the 99 sheep, and then there's like the one that goes scattering away. That's the exact one that God is going to send you out. It's like, oh, gosh, here we go. The wandering sheep of the world, as it were, right? And so it's about God, help me to identify the sheep of that you need me to minister to. Because I think that all of you know that the things that you've gone through in your life certainly have not been just for you. But there's somebody, and I know it's, it sounds like a needle in a haystack, but I promise you this is true, that at some point you're going to encounter somebody that's going through the exact same thing that you have went through already. Now, many times you worry, this is how we are, us church folks worry about being the expert in the verse, the expert in the chapter, the expert in the text. But what God is really looking for is somebody that's the expert in the testimony that can say, you know what, I've been there, I've done that, and I've survived, and I've made it, and you can make it too. I, I think that there's some excellent testimonies of that we can share. We have young women, uh, missionaries, we have young women. Um, that, that believe that the only way that they have any significance is if there's some man that validates them. And so if they are not constantly, you know, the, 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 the object of someone's affection, and if they are not demonstrating that, and you know what that means, etc., that they feel like they are less than or whatever, they need to hear the testimony of how God can keep somebody over a period of time. You know, some of the of you can't go without two weeks, right? But they know really, and they need to hear the testimony of somebody that say, you know, God really can't keep you. You don't hear it, I'm telling you, right? Because it's one thing to just hear the text, but you need somebody that can actually testify and show the fact that, you know, no, God can actually help you walk this thing out. That has to take it from the theoretical to the practical. And say, so what do you do? Who do you talk? What do you, how do you make this thing work? Do you just read ten Bible verses and that's that what happens? Well, how does this thing work? And most people have lived like, no, you don't just read ten Bible verses. Okay. So there's more to it that we've got to live it out. And we've got to help people understand how this thing really works. Which means that you sometimes have to have some difficult conversations. Because for many of us, when we live this thing out, you didn't get it right the first ten times. Right? And so somebody needs to be able to, 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 to have you help them and help them as they're walking and stumbling and walking and falling and walking because the secret to your walk as a Christian is not that you never stumble. It's not that you never fail. It's that you kept getting up and trying it over and over again. And as you kept walking, you learn how to walk by walking. 
You learn how to walk this out by doing it. And as you kept doing it, you got better at doing it. But the issue is that too often we have people that are trying to walk it and they feel like a there and no one's there telling them, no, no, just at the point where you feel so it's not working, that's when you keep on going. And then you're able to see God do awesomely amazing things in your life. Just when it seems like your faith has run out, that's actually when God is strengthening your faith. I remember, that's why I need a good personal trainer. I do. That's why we have been working on that. Um, I remember um, sometimes lifting weights, he told you to lift to the point of failure. Right? And so you lift weights and then you lift again. Well, because you can't do it, then you can't. Right? That's when you're really working it, right? You really lift to the point of failure. And the problem is that we see failure as defeat. But really, that's oftentimes what God is using to actually strengthen us. And if we can push through what looks like defeat and failure, that's when you'll see the power of God really come up and, and, and come to life in your life. I think that there's a lot to be said um, for people that are accessible, a lot to be said for people that are willing um, to get in the trenches because most people that are shepherds, you know, it, it's dirty work. It, it's, it's oftentimes thankless work. It's not prestigious work. It's nothing like that. Uh, but if we really see ourselves as being responsible for sheep, for really being responsible for someone else's life, I, I think that going through life becomes a little bit more easier to bear. All you've got to do is find that one person a couple of times when all of a sudden everything starts making sense to you. It, it's funny, I, I, I've encountered people um, that say, oh my goodness, I, I don't know what to do. I was just like, oh my gosh, that's so funny. Me and Lady went through that exact same thing. And of course when we were going through that exact same thing, we weren't thinking, one day someone will come to us. But no, you don't think that way. You don't. In fact, you think like, oh, this is terrible. This is horrible. Why is this not working? I think it, it's funny. This is a plug, right? So I'm going to all get us like $1,000 gifts. But uh, our anniversary is coming up, you know, in a couple of days, 18 years. And, and, and one of the things that was helpful for us, and, and it was funny because we, we tried to tell people you didn't listen to us. And, and now, you know, in many cases, we're one of the few people left still married. But when we first started out of marriage, well, I don't know how we bumped into a private family radio. You know, we were listening to um, somebody that said, they this thing called A Weekend to Remember. And we'd go. And I'm telling you, we went, and it was not what I expected. I thought it was going to be a nice, relaxing weekend. You get there on a Friday evening, like around 8 o'clock, the first session starts, something like that. And the session goes up until like 10 o'clock at night. Then you go to bed and you wake up and like first thing in the morning, there's more sessions and all these people talk and you're taking notes and then they're like, okay, now you're gonna have a date night, but this is your homework while you're on your date. And you wake up, you have more sessions to go through. It's like, oh my gosh, there's so much work. But in the midst of that, guess what they had? These amazing people have been married for like 50 and 60 years who sit there and tell you not about how wonderful their marriage is, but about the struggles and the difficulty. Now, I'm not telling you not to come to church and tell us about good things anymore. I want you to tell about the goodness of the Lord. But at the same time, part of the issue is that we need people that will give valid stories if we're going to effectively feed people. you got to give people the dessert and they've got to get, you know, the vegetables. you got to get that stuff they don't like. you got to give them that balanced meal. And the issue is that when we went to these seminars, I'm telling you, people would tell us all kinds of stories about things they encountered, things they went through, and it wasn't so we could leave and be like, mm, can you believe what they went through? Oh, I can't believe it. But it was more like, wow, if they went through that and they said I lifted up now, what we're going through isn't as bad anymore. I can make it based on seeing what they went through and how they survived and how they overcame. And I think that for many of us, we need to realize that God not only uses our triumphs, but God oftentimes also uses our troubles and our difficulties and our failures in ways that are absolutely beyond our wildest dreams and, and imaginations. 
Um, it oftentimes it's not what you've done right or done well that really convinces you somebody. As, as contradictory as it seems, sometimes it's what has gone wrong and how God has allowed that to somehow work out in a way that, hey, I'm here now in spite of where I've been. That makes sense to anybody? That, 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 and then those are the stories, these are the experiences that God has invested in us. Because at the end of the day, I need to tell you one thing before I close, and I'm cognizant that our young people have something they need to attend to this afternoon. <laughs> but one thing, um, before I close, probably more than one thing, before I close, something else I need to tell you um, before I quit is that you do realize that when the disciples were preaching in the early church, Nobody was going home with Bibles that said, and Jesus did this, and Jesus did that. The Bible hadn't been completed yet. The Bible hadn't been written yet. There were no, the Gospels in many cases had not been completed yet. God bless you, young people, thank you so much. The Bible had not been completed yet. What were people, how are people learning about Jesus? How are people learning how to walk this out before there was a Galatians, before there was an Ephesians? They were talking to other Christians. And so they went house to house and they talked and they shared. And dare I say it, they ate food. Here's what I'm going to tell you that might shock you. If you were to look at the first century church and look at even our church, it would be very starkly different. They look amazingly different. Because the early church was a church that was all about community. Right? And so when I, I'll tell you a story. These stories just keep coming. Y'all got to pray for me. There was a young lady that was a member of a church that we attended. She was. And um, while we were at the church, you know, she was doing okay, doing well. At some point, we had a believe in the church. We started GFG board happening. Uh, we heard from the young lady a little bit later and found out to my heart that she had um, left Christianity. Not just left the church, left Christianity and had embraced Islam, had become Muslim. And I could not understand for the life of me how it is that a person that's in church could leave church and go to Islam. I just didn't understand it. Notwithstanding, and it's for doctrinal difference, but I just did not understand it conceptually. How does this happen? But, you know, instead of, you know, how did you make this you know, I'm banging her over the head? Um, I believe it was a lady who just started asking questions about asking questions about the experience. And let me tell you what happened some weird stuff that you might never thought of. She said that, you know, she was talking to um, a, a gentleman at the time, right? Talking to him, whatever. And she had just asked a question. And he said, well, you know, honestly, I'm probably not the best person to answer this question for you, but I have someone that you can talk to, a very young lady you can speak to. And so he arranges for her to meet with this young lady. Um, and they go, and he go, she goes to the house with him. And of course, when he goes, I think he like turns his back, whatever, so that he can't see the young lady would have it because it's their custom. And goes into the house, and they begin talking. Now, as they're talking, the young lady she's talking to, in a matter of moments, now has the room filled. Makes a couple phone calls, has the room filled with other Muslim women. And they are now all around her, surrounding her, and talking to her about their experiences with Islam. They got her little thing through her head and everything, all that kind of stuff. And within a matter of moments, she had now been engulfed into the community. And they had surrounded her, so she felt like she was part of something. That was, and they just sitting around having a good time, etc. Now, I'm not telling you that it's wrong to go to church. We go to church every week. But what I'm telling you is that if you're going to effectively disciple people, it's got to be more than just church service. Does that make sense? Right? Because the winning of souls, we can do signs, wonders, and miracles here. But guess what? To really connect with people, guess what you gotta do? You've got to really connect with people. Which is oftentimes difficult to do in seats that are all facing this way. Right? But you've got to build relationships and talk to people and interact with people. And that's what they did. And because of that interaction, they were able to, she's able to ask questions, they're asking, and she's actually not only getting to know about Islam, but guess what? She's getting to know about them and their individual journeys, and from learning about their individual journeys, her interest in it begins to peak. And now, now we can debate about whether it was the proper thing for her to learn or what have you, and I believe she actually came back to us, praise our God. But, 
there's something to be learned from that experience. And that is that as much as, because honestly, she wasn't really a person that was predisposed to Islam. I'm like, she's like, oh, I, I, I want to be that. But it just happened that because she was in that environment, in that context, it made it something where, see, they could actually talk to her and she could see what the benefits were. Why don't we have things in Christianity where people can actually talk and see the benefits and <laughs> non-threatening environments help to share our faith that people just come together and eat food, lady, and talk about the goodness of Jesus and help people to understand more about God. Does that make sense to anybody? So in the, in the, in the New Testament, what you'll find is that Peter will preach to three, the preach and 3,000 people will get saved. But after that, guess what they do? They go from house to house. They go, like, I'm at this person's house. And guess what? We just chilling, talking. Yeah, man. Jesus really didn't get up. And this right comes to us unexpected. Hey, man, are you know Jesus falls? Yeah, we know Jesus falls. It's like, oh, cool. That's what's up. That's up. It's like, y'all don't really believe Jesus got up there. It's like, yeah, we actually do. How do you know that? Because I was talking to Peter. And Peter told us that. And as Peter was talking, I started speaking in language. I didn't even know the language. It's like, yeah, I was there. I heard it. It made no sense to me how he could speak that language. I know his whole life. He ain't ever speak that language before, right? And so he starts sharing. It's like, oh, and by the way, I was that beggar that was at the gate, you know. And I couldn't walk, but everybody knows. Look at me. I'm walking now. You know, and so everybody's telling these stories, but it's an environment of authenticity. And they're sharing, and they're communicating with each other, and they're eating food, and they're talking to one another, and they're relating to one another. And people that are not part of the community say, you know what? Those Christian group people, they sell, that's, that's a tight knit group. I want to be part of that tight knit group. Now, you might think that's not important, but I'm, I'm coming to a point. The point is that whenever we've done studies of young people and gang activity, young people and drugs, and young people on pretty much almost every other vice, it always tends to come back to they felt like they weren't a part of anything. Right. It felt like they weren't really part of a community. They felt isolated. And we live in days and times now where people are even part of families and feel isolated. What a great chance the church has to reach out to people that are marginalized, to reach out to people that are isolated, to reach out to people that feel as though, wow, there's nobody I can depend to turn. Wouldn't it be great if the church could be community for them? And so what happens is that this, this enclave, this Christian community, they become known, not only because they believe that Jesus gets up from them, from the day which is crazy though, right? I don't think really they believe in resurrection. But they also become known because it's like, yeah, I heard they become those Christian people, they take care of each other. They watch out for one another. I heard this as well. And it seems to be true because they've done it from many sources. Um, that many people, when they find themselves in trouble or in prison, sometimes they align themselves with a particular religion because they know they'll be taken care of there with that. And it's an awesome opportunity for us to turn out. We ain't gonna put little, little knives and stuff. Like, you know, we ain't, we, ain't, we ain't about that life. But it is important that the church not be absent. Right? It is important that somebody should be there and should say, you know what? You're going through a difficult time in life right now. And we need to get better at that when people come out of certain lifestyles or come out of certain things that they've been involved in that we don't forget to send them back to places where they can minister most effectively. And so if you've had experience in prison or something like that, many times it's important to send them back so they can go back and say, you know what, your life does not have to end here. Not what that woman at the well did. She went back and said, come see a man. And she was able to convince them because they knew the before and the after story. We all like the after stories, but sometimes people need to be able to have a before story that they can relate to. I'm gonna tell you this, I need to stop, right? I do need to say this, right? <laughs> I, I, I look at those commercials, because you know, I don't know, ever since I was young, I always look at those commercials like, oh my goodness, I could be like, Ugh, you know? It probably comes from all those wrestling tapes from money to get from when I was a kid. But I'm looking at whatever. And when I look at those like, little products, whatever, 
always looks like, hold up, you were ultra skinny before, and now you're skinny afterwards. I'm not listening to you. <laughs> you look for somebody that looks like you, and you say, what happens when they do it? And that makes it more compelling. The problem is that people look for somebody that looks like them, and they look at church, and all they see is people like, but they don't have any of the four pictures to relate to. Right? They need to hear that they can make it for And I get it, that in Christ you'll be like, but when I'm here, I don't know how to get from here to there. And that's why we need people to actually feed them and help them to make it from here to there. I think it's great that oftentimes, in corporate America even, we have what's called mentorship programs. And the reason why we have those is because sometimes you have people that are in the workforce that just haven't had the connections necessary to really understand how things work and how to navigate things. And oftentimes, don't even think they can get from a position where they are to a position up here. So somebody will come, and I'll talk to somebody that can relate to, you know, for one reason or another, to where this person is and actually show them, hey, I used to work a job just like that 10 years ago. And then over time, I did this, this, and this. And you may not follow the exact same path that I did, but what I want to show you is that it's possible. And this is how I did it. And I can give you an advice. If you want to sound any more, you want somebody to speak to about it, I'm here to actually help you get from where you are to whatever your dream is. And I think that we need something like that in the church today. I think that we need to fulfill that role of helping people to make that transition from where they are to where, they, they, where they, they, they can be in God, to show them possibility again, to show them that there is a brighter future, to show them all that. And here's the kicker about it. When God wants to move somebody from here to there, he always sends a person. <laughs> he always uses people. And here's the other funny thing. He always uses people that always feel that they're not qualified to do and so today, as I'm closing, if you're hearing this, but you're saying, that sounds great. I want to see people get delivered. I want to see people get set free. I want to see people grow in God. But I don't feel qualified to do that. I don't feel like, you know, I could do that. I'm thinking that could be me. I'm telling you today, that's exactly the type of person that God often uses. And just when you feel like it can't be you, that's when God is actually trying to use you up to do amazing things that are beyond even your comprehension. And so when God wanted to deliver and make a way in judges as Elder Green preached, he used a man called Gideon who did not come from the right family, who didn't have anything in his pedigree that would make it seem like he could be used, and yet God had a plan for his life. When God wanted to deliver the, the, um, the Israelites out of the hands of the Egyptians, he used a man called Moses who said, I can't even speak right now. I'm slow to speech, and yet God used Moses. When God wanted to save the world um, from the flood, or at least to save those eight from the flood, he used a man whose name is Noah, who we will find later on becomes overcome by drunkenness and even takes part in incestuous relationships, but yet God still used him because God oftentimes uses the most unlikely candidates in order to do his work and to do his will. Dare I submit to you that when God wants to save people, he does not use angels, he uses people. If God wanted angels, he would have used angels. Instead, what he often uses is human beings. People just like you and me. And the only thing is, if we will submit ourselves to him, if we will just simply say yes to him, God can utilize us to do these amazing things. And so it's not ability, because one of Lady's favorite preachers back then was Jessica Planus, and he had this whole message called, doing the things I cannot do. It's not ability, because if we're honest, most things God asks us to do, if it's God, we can't do it. We don't have the power in ourselves to do it. We don't have the strength in ourselves to do it. I can't turn somebody's life around. I don't have the power myself to do it. I can't. It's bigger than me. It's certainly bigger than me. So it's not ability. It's not intellect. Because, I mean, 
Intellect does not help you win souls. They can win arguments, but nobody cares if you win the argument. I wish Christians would learn that. Nobody cares if you're right or not. It really doesn't matter. Well, I believe that this is wrong. And it's like, okay. But at the end of the day, you win the argument, then what? They still do what they want to do. Who cares? We're not here to win arguments. We're not here to win minds. We're here to win hearts. So it's not intellectualism that counts. What else could it be? Having enough money. Well, money does not help you most of the time. It's not money. It's not the right money. What can qualify you effectively for ministry? What can qualify you? Why would God use you to reach somebody else? Why would God use you to replicate disciples? Why would God use you to feed his sheep? Not the best seminaries, but that's not it. Because some of the greatest revivalists in this world never went to seminary. In fact, a man named Smith Wigglesworth was actually a, 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 a plumber by trade. And I don't think he ever finished more than fourth grade or something crazy like that. So no, it's not by that, not academics. Maybe it's what Jesus said. Maybe it goes back to, lovest thou me. And if he knows that you love him, somehow you'll produce other people that love him too. Somehow if your motives are right, your motives being, I'm doing because I love him. Somehow if your motives are right, and if you're feeding people with the right motives, not feeding people because you're guilty, they're greedy for filthy lucre, as the Bible says, right? Not because you're trying to use this means to make money. Not because you're trying to make yourself famous. Not because you want to become well-known and popular. Not because you want to be on the latest magazine. Not because, you know, you want to have this awesome venture. People like say, yes, this person is one of the most top 20 influential people in the inner city of America. But because you love him, God can use you to reach other people that will learn to love him as well. And so the, 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 the critical question um, that we ask is, not what's your degree in, or how many degrees do you have? The question that we ask is, not how smart you are, or what your key talents or abilities even are. But the question we ask is the question that Jesus says, do you really love him? And if you love him, you can do this. If you love him, you can do this. If you love him, you can do this. I think there are many of us who have gone through things in life where really it was only your love for God that enabled you to endure. And as you look back, you say, oh my goodness, how did I make it? It's like, it wasn't just me. And, and notice the question is not, and I do need to conclude, the question is not, do you believe me? The question is, do you love Because belief can qualify you for miracle signs and wonders, but only love qualifies you to really feed the people of God, to really give them what they can desire. Because it's your love, it's that motivation of love that will actually draw them. That's what's actually going to be that makes the difference. The text says, no, know that you're a Christian by the love that you have, one for another. And what identified that early church was the fact that they actually, at the end of the day, they absolutely loved one another. But they loved one another because they also loved God, and the love of God, which was shed upon their hearts by the Holy Ghost, was absolutely contagious. And people may down a whole lot of things, they may get mad at a whole lot of things, but one thing that remains one of the most powerful forces in the universe is the power of loving one another. And when you love God and you love people, first of all, you fulfill the two greatest commandments, right? That's what Jesus said. But secondly, you create an environment and a community that is absolutely contagious. And people feel comfortable enough that they'll be able to actually eat, right? Because the sheep feels in danger, they eat nothing. You're constantly looking around, whatever. It's like, eat, you're going to starve. But I'm scared. Well, you're going to die. But I'm scared. <laughs> but perfect love casts out all fear. 
And when you're able to create an atmosphere where people that have fear of rejection, fear of failure, feel as though they are loved, guess what? Fear of rejection and fear of failure all of a sudden they begin to disappear. Fear of abandonment begins to disappear. And then people can actually begin to really grow and develop and eat without being self-conscious. Does that make sense? Because as long as people are holding themselves back because of fear and all those sort of things, they'll never come to full maturity. In fact, I think that for many people, I do need to stop, but I keep hearing stuff. I think that for many people, you almost have to watch them. You know, when, when, it, when you first put a, a child on the bicycle, and they're going downhill, and they're like doing whatever, it's not when they're on a bicycle and they're riding that they need you. When they need you most is when they fall. Not that my bicycle riding expert. But when they need you most is when they fall, so you'll get back, they get false, so they'll get back on and try it again. And so, in church, oftentimes we have new beliefs and they're around us when they make their initial confession. They're, we're all around. When they get back, we're all around. When they first get going, we're all around for that. But we need people that will be around. But when they, when they first scrape their knee that first time, they're like, oh man, I scraped my knee. And you need to have people that are in place and that can be there to say, yeah, we've all been there and done that. But don't stay there. Get up and let's keep on going. It's going to be okay. It's going to be all right. Guess what it does? It keeps them from ever fearing failure again. Because as long as you are afraid of failure, you'll still, you'll still be in bondage. Even if you're afraid of something that's a bad thing, the fear of failure will screw you up every time. I think it was Job that said, the thing that I fear the most has come upon me. And that's how life often is, right? The thing you fear the most oftentimes comes upon us. But the environment and the context of God is such that we have so much love that fear just gets thrown out of it. That fear just gets thrown out of it. And then we can effectively be. I hope this makes sense. I know it's a whole lot of stuff. Longer than I originally anticipated, I blame you all. But I pray that it helps you, and I'm praying that it helps those people that you need to be connected to, to help you to effectively reach them. God has ordained us that we should bring forth much fruit, that our fruit should remain, and we've got to reach them. We've got to effectively reach them. We're standing, we're praying. Amen. Giving God glory for all of his goodness and kindness towards us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Again, we have reason to celebrate this morning. We heard somebody in the church got blessed with the car. Well, let's clap our hands and celebrate. Has been good to us, and we thank him so much again. New car, new birthday, all this kind of exciting stuff. Amen. Another year, all this kind of exciting stuff happening. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood, right? Amen. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you. What a great God you are. How faithful you are to us. You are our Savior. You're our Master. You're our Lord, our Lord. But also, you've called us friend. And we thank you, God, for this opportunity that we have to have been able to hear from you, to be able to peer into your word, to be able to hear, oh God, your heartbeat, your concern, your priorities, oh God things that you have on your mind. We pray, God, in the name of Jesus, that you will cause us to prioritize what you prioritize, oh God, to, to feel what you feel, oh God, to love as you love, in the name of Jesus. We pray, God, that this word, oh God, will produce something in us that will enable us, oh God, to reach out to sheep, oh God, some of which are misguided, some of which are lost, some of which are just discouraged, some of which are in, are wallowing in despair. And yet, God, we know that you can use us, that you can use us, oh God, to, to rescue, that you can use us, oh God, to feed and to nourish, to encourage and to direct back to the proper path. And God, we humbly accept the assignments that you have given us. Father, we thank you, Lord, for what we have experienced in our lives. We thank you, Lord, for difficult times, for trying times, for 
frustrating times and even failing times. For God, we know that in the midst of this, you've been able to use it in a way, and you can still use it in a way, oh God, that will bring you glory and encourage somebody else. Lord, help us to see the big picture. Help us to see the macro environment. Help us to see, God, that there's somebody who's in need today. And Lord, as we're praying for ourselves, and we pray for our families, and we pray for those that are really connected to us, God, help us not to forget to pray for lost sheep. Help us not forget to pray, oh God, for those that are wandering and wandered off the path. And God, help us not to forget people that are just like us, that just haven't arrived to where we've arrived yet. People that are us 10 years ago, people that are us five years ago, people that may even be us one year ago. God, help us, oh God, in the name of Jesus, to make proper connections, oh God, and to help them along the path of life. In the name of Jesus, God, help us, oh God. God, help us. Give us the right words, God, help us. Give us the right words, God, help us. Give us the strong anointing we need, God, help us. God, we pray in the name of Jesus. We thank you and we bless your name. God, say amen.